in Bhagavatam. I decided to go back a couple of verses from where we were a couple of weeks ago and uh, just review one point which came up yesterday. What, what is the goal? And knowing what is the goal. Right? So I thought I'd just back up a couple of verses, read that, read something here in uh, the talks of Ramananda and Mahaprabhu. So backing up a few verses, um, back to verse 5. Munaya sadhu prishtoham bhavad bhir lokamangalam yat krita krishna samprasno yen atma suprasiddhiti. O sages, I have been justly questioned by you. Your questions are worthy because they relate to Lord Krishna and so are of relevance to the world's welfare. Only questions of this sort are capable of completely satisfying the self. Savai punsam paro dharmo yato bhaktir adhoksaje ahaituki apratiyata yena masuprasiddhiti. The supreme occupation for all humanity is that by which men and women can attain to loving devotional service unto the transcendental Lord. Such devotional service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted to completely satisfy the self. Vasudeve Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janayati Asuvairagyam Jnanam Chayarahoitukam by rendering devotional service unto the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Dharma svanustita punsam vishvaksena katasuya notpadayad yadi ratim srama eva hikevalam The occupational duties a man performs according to his own position are only so much useless labor if they do not provoke attraction for the message of the Personality of Godhead. Dharma shahi apabhargasya narato arata yo pakaopate narata shya dharma ikantasya kanarmo labhaya hi smritaha All occupational engagements are certainly meant for ultimate liberation. They should never be performed for, for material gain. Furthermore, according to sages, one who is engaged in the ultimate occupational service should never use material gain to cultivate sense gratification. Oops. Karmasya nindriya pratir labo jiveta yavata jivasya tattva jignasa narato yascha karma bihi. Life's desires should never be directed toward sense gratification. One should desire only a healthy life or self preservation, since a human life is meant for inquiry about the absolute truth. Nothing else should be the goal of one's works. Varanti tat tat pavedas tatvam yajjnanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti sabjate Learned transcendentalists who know the absolute truth call this non-dual substance brahman, paramatma and bhagavan. Takshradhadanamunayo jnanavairagya ryuptaya pashanti atmani chatmanam bhaktya sruta grihetaya. The seriously inquisitive student or sage, well equipped with knowledge and detachment, realizes the absolute truth by rendering devotional service in terms of what he has heard from the Vedanta Sruti. All right, I'll stop there. And the same continues, uh, the same focus. Huh? So the goal of life, the goal of human life, 
which we mentioned yesterday, or day before yesterday. That is to know the absolute truth. What is the truth? To be able to, distru- uh, uh, to distinguish truth from an untruth, truth from distortion. What is the absolute truth? That is the supreme goal of life. Um, that is a big subject, just as this is a big country. Uh, Giri Maharaj was saying uh, something about the American accent yesterday, and I asked him, which accent? There are so many American accents. But having not gone very far in this country, he has not encountered the Georgia accent, the Alabama accent, the Texas accent, the, the New Yorkers accent. There's so many accents in this country. This is a big country. So the absolute truth is a big topic, much bigger than this country. Hmm? But generally it is said there are three departments or three divisions, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Um, you hear a lot of, uh, from the general people about uh, uh, Brahman, Brahma Jyoti. Uh, they have heard that truth is light. Hmm? Ignorance is darkness. Uh, and truth dispels ignorance. Truth is light. Hmm? And they have a conception that, that truth is a very brilliant light, an effulgent transcendental light, and that realizing truth means to be absorbed into that light. They are not fully correct, and they are not fully wrong either. Hmm? Krishna has an effulgent light that is called Brahma Jyoti, that emanates from his transcendental body. Hmm? That light is all-knowing, that light is truth. Hmm? That light indeed does dispel uh, darkness, Brahma Jyoti. Hmm? Uh, that is known as Krishna's impersonal aspect. Then, more concentrated, hmm, uh, the next or ele- more elevated stage of truth above light consciousness hmm, is Paramatma. Paramatma means the super soul who is situated in the hearts of all living beings, who is situated in every atom, and who is situated in between every atom and who never leaves the side of a living entity in this material world, regardless, in any condition, in any number of lifetimes, in any place in this universe, the super soul accompanies the living entity by his side and situated within his heart. There is a a small controversy going on in the Vaishnava world, very, very small, It's, it's hard to just find it, but it's out there. <clears throat> Some people say the super soul is situated in your heart. Mm-hmm. That means your heart, blood heart. Mm-hmm. And others are saying, no. Some are saying the soul, uh, super soul is situated in your heart as two birds are sitting in a tree. Mm-hmm. So your soul, Atma, is situated in the region of your heart, blood heart. And the super soul is sitting right next to him like two birds in a tree, the tree being the heart and the two birds being the soul and the super soul. Then there is another section which says that, well, that is more or less allegorical. Actually, the super soul is situated in the heart of the soul. Mm-hmm. He is in your heart. Um, the second is true, actually. Mm-hmm. The first one has somehow misunderstood some Upanishad verses and, and some descriptions from Bhagavatam somehow is misunderstood. The, the super soul, the smallest particle in this world is the soul. It's smaller than the atom. And Krishna is smaller than the smallest and enters the heart of the smallest. Hmm? So <clears throat> that means that he is situated in the, in the heart of the soul. Hmm? What do we mean when we say heart? What is the heartland of America? Well, it's out there in Idaho and all that Midwestern. If you go there, does it look like a big heart? No, it means the heart, in English, the heartland means, you know, down in the breadbasket. Another thing, that's another allegory, the breadbasket. So when you go there, does it look like a breadbasket? No, it means the, in the, the essence of the land, the essence of the people, the essence of the culture. 
So the heart of the soul, the soul doesn't have a heart per se, as we know a biological heart, but it means the very essence of the, uh, of, of, of the existence of the soul, the, the super soul, is there within. So <clears throat> the super soul, uh, as uh, Brahman realization may be achieved, <clears throat> may be achieved through uh, external process of meditation and, and um, elimination of what is matter, what is spirit. It's called niti, 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 not this, not this, not this, not this. You eliminate what it's not and ultimately arrive at what it is. But this is a, this is a self-assertive process and it only reaches up so far. Then uh, more achievement in that, in that world um, and a, quite a, a bit of the processes described in Srimad Bhagavatam and other places. Uh, one may have the opportunity to see uh, in meditation the Lord situated in his heart mm, in the form of the super soul. Mm. Um, and it is, it is said that the yogi in perfect realization of the super soul, he sees the Lord in his heart and he appears to be about the size of, the Lord, uh, of your thumb. Thumb-sized Lord within the heart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very few of these yogis understand who that super soul is. The 99.9% .9 of them, almost the 100% of them, think that that super soul is themselves. And they, menace, mi uh, again, misidentify their self with the supreme self. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the light mergers they consider that light to be the supreme self and they become lost in that light. Mm -hmm. Just like we are lost in light when a powerful light is put in our face, our own personal existence gets lost in that light. We can't even see our face. We can't even see ourselves if light is so bright. You see, they, beca they, 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 they become confused. From our point of view, confused, they have become the light. And confused when seeing the super soul, they think that they are seeing their self. So the destination of both the Brahman realized yogis and the Paramatman realized yogis at the end of this life, when they give up this uh, body in this life, both go to Brahma Jyoti. They enter into Brahma Jyoti, even the Paramatman realized yogi. Although the Paramatma descends from Vaikuntha, ultimately, the form of the Lord is found first in Vaikuntha and then upwards in other spiritual realms, by realizing that form of the Lord, but by misidentification of that form, that that is their very self, you see, slight misunderstanding there, they then do not enter into any service inquiries. And without service, you cannot enter the spiritual world. So here becomes an interesting point. What is the goal of life? The goal of life is to realize the truth, the absolute truth, and to be engaged in service of that truth. Service and truth are the first two goals which we should approach. In the top realm of the spiritual world, rasa is present. But you cannot jump from the valley to the top of the mountain. You have to hike every inch of the way, not eliminating any step along the way, or you may fall down or you may end up in another place. So the first goal of human life is to know <coughs> what is the truth. And then, entering into the truth to seek service of the truth. Service is what qualifies us to enter into the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. That is a foundation of, 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 of attaining uh, real qualification. Now, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has summed up the whole elaborate process in one verse. Prema Pumarto Mahan. He says, the ultimate goal of human life is to develop love of Krishna, love of God. Prema. Prema Pumartha Mahan. This is the ultimate goal. So, indeed, this is the ultimate goal of truth. This is the ultimate goal of service. And this is the ultimate goal in rasa also. In the highest world where devotees are serving Krishna, they may even be looking like they're enjoying with Krishna. Krishna is enjoyer. And they may look like they're enjoying Mm -hmm. But uh, those who are expert in the science of love, 
have told us, oh, they are not enjoying anything. They have no desire to enjoy whatsoever. Their only desire hmm, is to please Krishna. If someone offers you something to eat and your belly is full, you say, no, thank you. But actually, if your guru offers you something to eat, even your belly is full, you should accept it. What would you do if you had just eaten and Krishna offered you something to eat? Would you reject it? Or you think, well, this is the chance of all chances and you, and you take it. But really why you would take from Krishna and why you would take from your guru or why you would take from anybody, why do you, when you go to someone's house and they offer you a piece of pie and you say, well, no, no, I've already eaten. Then they persist, but it's only a small piece. Have just a small piece. And then you relent. Oh, okay, but just a small piece. Actually, you're full. Then the host understands, okay, they're full. But the host is saying, but we want to serve you and, and, and uh, we'll be very happy if you will accept some of this pie. We will be very pleased if you accept some of this pie. So then we say, okay, I'll have a small piece to please you. So to please Krishna, Krishna's devotees perform many pastimes and sometimes appear to be enjoying. Why did Madhu Mangal, one of the cowherd boys, he loves sweets, it is said. Huh? And he begs sweets from Krishna and he can eat more sweets than everybody and anybody else put together more or less, particularly Ladus. But, but is he an enjoyer in the spiritual world? He's one of the ones that they couldn't throw out or something. He's just a big enjoyer there and he's doing everything to satisfy his senses? Not at all. Actually, he's doing everything to satisfy Krishna. He's begging sweets. He's giving blessings. He may even be stealing sweets from others. He has every trick up his sleeve imaginable to get more sweets and eat sweets. And ultimately, Krishna laughs uh, to see him so eager to eat sweets at any cost, at any means, say anything, do anything, get sweets eat sweets, and Krishna enjoys seeing that behavior. There is no, uh, to enjoy means separate something, separate from Krishna to enjoy. And in the spiritual world, no one is separate from Krishna. No one has separate interest. And enjoyment couldn't happen there even if it wanted to. Because enjoyment is not what it looks like. Like I was saying the other day, I wash a window, you know, Mr. Kramer washes a window. Looks like the same thing, you see, but it's not. I'm washing for Krishna, he's washing for himself. I am doing for Krishna, no separate interest, his whole thing is separate interest. The real issue is separate interest, not the thing in front that may be being done or in front of us, you see. Once I, I got a real good example in India, it was the hot season and we were speaking with some... Uh, young man from Delhi, a devotee, from a devotee family, and uh, speaking very long with him in the park at the, uh, inside the, the uh, Red Fort in Delhi, and there's big parks inside, <coughs> and it was summer season, it was May, it was in the shade, it was 115, 118 degrees, dry heat. So after about an hour of talking, I mean, my mouth was like cotton balls, and and uh, I just had to get something to drink. Well, the only, there was I wasn't going to drink the Delhi municipal water; it might have been my last drink. So, what do you do out there? You go for this. You go for the sodas. That's potentially potentially better than the tap water. So there was another devotee with me. I said, "Let's let's go get something to drink." So we walk over to this Limpa stand, and I told him. I want two. And then I told him, well, whatever you like, get something to drink, right? So this boy got a very strange look in his face, and he drank something, but he maintained this strange like look in his face for about 15 minutes. And when we went back to sit down under the tree, then he said, Shrami, why are you enjoying the limka? And I thought, you call this enjoyment? <laughs> I was just getting something to drink. <laughs> but I noticed I just drank the thing to quench my thirst. And he sipped away on it. 
you see. So in his world, that's a big thing. Him and a couple of his friends go down and each one of them buys an eight rupee limka at the time and sits around and sips on it for a half hour. That's called teenage enjoyment in Delhi, you see. Oh, this was an enjoyment for me. You know, I just drank it because I was thirsty, you see. So, but he was enjoying his soda, and I was simply drinking mine. <clears throat> and I've noticed that even in the West, it's best when getting new devotees in an ashram. It's not good to, you know, stop the car on the way and get them some soda and things like this, because the fine line internally in the consciousness between I'm enjoying and I'm just quenching my thirst even is a very fine line. Because materialistic culture trains us to enjoy everything. One person even said, I'm so fallen, I enjoy passing stool. And actually, in Western culture, yeah, there are even sayings about that. Enjoying a, a good <laughs> movement. And they have the magazine rack, and they have sound systems in the bathrooms, and all kinds of things. It's an enjoyable place. Yeah, in spiritual culture, get in, get out. It's not a not a pleasant place, you see. But they have even taken enjoyment to enjoy even the, the most fundamental bodily function in this way. Enjoyment, enjoyment. Enjoyment is the disease. It's like I mentioned the other day. The one young man told Srila Sridhar Maharaj, well, I didn't, marry, I didn't get married. I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to get bogged down. or what is, Oh, be attached. I forget exactly how he, he expressed it. Then Srila Sridhar told him, wrong answer, wrong answer. All indicative of irresponsibility, not the right answer. The right answer is, actually, I just want to give all of my service to Guru and Krishna. I, I, I don't want to spend any time in any other plane of service. Just there I want to serve. Then that's laudable to remain a brahmachari or to become a sannyasi. But just to avoid the responsibility of family life, there's no sufficient reason. You see. Although only those who are duly responsible should actually take up family life. Still, that is, that is not a good reason. Then he said, he said, there is nothing wrong with women. What is wrong is the I, 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 idea or I, I, uh, conception to exploit them that is within you. The wrong is in you. you see. It's not, not in them. The, the, the wrong is in you. So in many, many things, the wrong is in me. It's not in anybody else. There's a saying, smile and the world smiles with you. Frown and you frown alone. So, you know, it's quite simple. And, uh, but, you know, the, the Vaishnava purport of that is that everything is within. Hmm? There is no bad. There is no harm. All these things are within. Hmm? An attitude. Like I said when I was out at Saranagati in one talk or something, I said, actually, the goal is just a feeling within the heart, to achieve a certain feeling within your heart. That's the goal of everything we do in Krishna consciousness, to awaken a particular feeling within the heart. Big elaborate temples, big extended programs, big video programs, world traveling, the whole, whatever it is, volumes of literature, Volumes of literature, it's just to awaken a feeling in the heart. Mahaprabhu says that is prema. That is the highest goal, the highest achievement. So, to approach the highest goal of life, we should, we should try to control those things which are against our better interest. And that, in a word, or in two words, is called sense gratification, material enjoyment. We should not cultivate that. We, we may have to accept that to a certain level, uh, we do. But we do not cultivate that independent of Krishna. Rather, we dovetail that necessity in relation to Krishna. We eat, drink, and make merry under the, under the guardian shelter of the Supreme Lord. We, we eat and drink that which is prasad and maha prasad. And we make merry in the association of devotees by chanting, dancing, having festivals, worshipping the deities, and all these types of things. Uh, our system is so superior to make merry uh, than anybody has got out there in the material world. 
and we used to point this out, that we were just up every day dancing and singing at 4.30 in the morning. Here it's later because of certain necessities. And But no, no, nobody after Friday night is up on Sunday morning dancing by 7.30. Nobody. They're just moaning and groaning, putting their head under the pillow, complaining of their headache, bellyache, all sorts of things. Nobody has the party spirit like we do, like the devotees do. Every day they are up for a dance and singing and singing and singing. And the songs we sing have remained at the top of the pops from beginning to end. We're not dissatisfied with this thing and then go to another one and then another song and then another song. We've got the supreme song. And you can't sing any song, however good it is. My Sweet Lord or whatever even. You'll get tired of it after a while. Any kind of song you become tired of. Even bhajans, if you don't know the meaning, you can sometimes may tire of the bhajan. Maha mantra is quite different than that. Absolute sound which puts us directly in touch with Krishna. So it's not a song of this world. It's a transcendental vibration. So these, uh, the materialists, they cannot, uh, they cannot sustain that same uh, interest in their enjoyment. However well they enjoy it, they become very frustrated with it very soon afterwards. So, in this explanation of the goal of life, we cultivate one thing, we, we try to keep away from some other thing. Within that, we, we come to this point that purity, we should seek purity. Hmm? Uh, certain things are contaminating. Hmm? Uh, they are contaminating to our senses. They are contaminating to our consciousness. They are contaminating to our mind. We should try to avoid those things, you see. Hmm? And we should cultivate the pure life. Hmm? When you cultivate that explanation, it comes to this point, we must become pure devotees of Krishna. We should not just be devotees of Krishna, but maintain all types of uh, impurities, you see. Uh, that can be done. Yeah. Just like you can show up to the community meeting wearing dirty clothes, you see, and uh, not bath and, and emitting a bad fragrance, you see. And yeah, you can still show up there. You see, but you won't be welcome there. You won't be appreciated there. Nobody's want to embrace you. Oh, they want to go back from you. you see? But you can show up there. You see, or you can show up there very clean, properly dressed, well behaved, and everything, and everyone will welcome you there. So you can do devotional service, maintaining all types of impurities, but it is not pleasing to Krishna. He does not look forward to that service coming in his direction. He does not welcome that so wholeheartedly. So service, just like we like somebody, we want to give a gift to express our appreciation for that person. But sometimes, and it is purely given, no ulterior murder. But sometimes that person may misread, that person not being so pure, may misread our intentions, you see, uh, or, and may think, oh, this is just being given to me because uh, he has a plan to ex exploit me, you see. Some flattery is being given. Actually, uh, he just wants my money, you see. It's like dealing with students. Many times a wise professor will not flatter and favor his, fa his favorite student. Favorite student he'll like because the, he or she is very enthused and doing well and studying hard. Huh? He may give flatter to a student of lower capacity because the student needs encouragement. But he may hesitate to flatter the better student because he doesn't want to put that student in jeopardy of, of, of becoming teacher's pet, you see, and then maybe the student will lose the, the edge of his or her, her focus, you see. So a wise professor will show his affection 
differently uh, and, and, and may not show great affection to someone who is actually, who is very, very dear and who is doing very, very well. Hmm? Or like in a reverse type of a situation, when Haridas Thakur went into the prison, everyone asked for his blessings and he said, yes, you'd be here in this miserable place forever. <laughs> they could not understand his blessings. But his point of view was, they've stopped all their nonsense, you see, they're not drinking and rowdy making every day, and they're standing here with folded hands in a submissive mood, so stay right where you are, it'll be good for you, you see. But how can they read and understand his blessings, you see. People approach sadhus, oh Swami, give you a blessing, but they don't know what blessings are. The famous story is there, and Prabhupada said, Do you want my blessings? Yes, Swamiji. Then he pointed to Brahmananda, who was standing behind him. Very big man, shaved head, big tea lot, saffron in a danda. He said, this is my mercy. The man was shaking and moving away. He asked him, well, what is mercy? And the man asked, said, health and wealth and nice things for family, and that is blessing." No, no, this is my blessing. So a lot of people don't know what to give your blessing, but when the blessing comes, they, 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 they don't want that. That's not what they had in mind. You see. After hearing many classes in Calcutta some years ago, then the supporting members of the community refused to chant Japa. They would serve, they would give money, that because they had caught this point that the holy name will destroy all your material desires. It will free you from material desires. So they misread that and said, well, we'll be happy to keep our material desires and just give some money to the temple. <laughs> and when they couldn't find it, they said, well, we don't understand. You'll give money, you do service, you just do all these things, but you won't chant any Maha Mantra on beads. Well, Swami, you know, we have caught the point. So they misunderstand everything, you see. So, <clears throat> it is hard to make progress. I think what Mother Dear Lalita was pointing at yesterday and saying, you have to know the goal. It means if you're living with so many misunderstandings about the process, it's hard to make advancement, you see. So you have to learn to discriminate what is pure, what is impure, what is pleasing to Guru Krishna and the Vaishnavas, what is not pleasing. And we learn there's some trial and error there. In fact, there's a lot of error. And there's a good trial ahead. There's a lot of time, you see. But one should not waste time and be a dullard about things. When mistakes are made, they should be corrected. But ultimately, one should try to learn how to please. Now, in a community of devotees, it becomes very practical. Okay. You have your guru. Well, Krishna is present for you in the form of the deity. Hmm? Then, uh, what happens in the beginning, we do something nicely just for our guru, and we stomp on everybody else's feet. Like the kirtan that dances around the guru, shouting, Jai Guru Dave, and whacks the other guy with the kartals in the face, and stomps all over people's toes, and, and everything. There are such kirtans. They get so enthusiastic about the deity, or about something, that they, they, they harm somebody else. There used to be this one devotee, when he would dance, he would put his hands out like this. And every day, somebody would get it right in the face, right? But it was so important that he would dance like this. And you couldn't get near him, you see, unless you wanted to walk up and give him an arm lock or something, you know. So, learning to please doesn't mean just please your guru and just please the deity like that. Learning to please means guru, Krishna, the Vaishnavas, and also the non-devotees. Not please them in the same way, but be so pleasing to them that they are attracted, they are charmed. Huh? It means very pleasing behavior, you see. I think, you know, some of our neighbors here, uh, uh, Ken has made several remarks about the girls who are living there, yourself and uh, Priya and uh, Adi Shakti. And he's charmed by their mature behavior. He's He's charmed by their activities. Previous tenant was, you know, wading through the beer bottles 
And uh, he's seen other girls of the similar age, and they're saying, wow, if our kids could turn out as good as these kids, wow, that would be really, really great. Well, no need to get puffed up about that, but just to make practical examples, what's that mean? It means their activities, behaviors, is, is, it's pleasing. Even to the non-devotee, if you are a devotee, it will be pleasing to the non-devotee. The demons might not find your behavior pleasing. That's a different thing. We're not so concerned about the demons. But just those who are not devotees, but who are potential candidates, who are decent human beings, um, even they may have so many bad qualities at heart, they are decent human beings. Uh, uh, they will be attracted. They will be pleased. You understand the difference in pleasing. You're not, you don't have to please their senses you know, and, and satisfy and provide for them sense gratification. But you should act in such a way that they find that your association, your behavior is very pleasing. And then in that way, they also get attraction. There is, uh, there is also offense to those persons. If you offend a devotee, that is bad. If you offend Krishna, that is bad. If you offend Guru, that is bad. But you may also offend another living entity. Killing is especially not good. Even incense. I was very... Happy to see the first time Mother Leela Smarna's flycatcher. In India, it's brutal. You know, I was very happy to see that. Just dispose of them outside, catch them, and throw them outside. You know, just don't squash them. You see, uh, it's just an insignificant fly. But if you were the fly, you might think different for the moment when you were being squashed. You see, so. But ultimately, you cannot move without killing some living entities. You see. But you shouldn't go out of your way particularly to kill living entities and cause harm to living entities. And I don't know, I, I, there was a devotee once and there was a, an animal that was hit on the road. And he just stopped and removed the animal to the bush in the natural surrounding. What, never, nature will take its course and went on. Most people would just leave the animal half dead on the road or even him. Or their concept of mercy is hit it again. Hit it again. Put it out of its misery. No. But a devotee is just like, well, put it back in its natural surroundings and let nature take its course or something like that. Or even maybe try to help the animal. Hmm? Judd Barrett, he took that position, tried to help that poor animal. It was, uh, it was a baby, deer, and the mother died and, and everything like that. So that's the nature of a devotee. But then he fell in love with the deer. That cute little deer became attached to him like a deer would its mother or something. Misidentifying. Actually, a little animal, if you separate it from its parents too early, it'll think you're the mother. You see. Uh, to Brian Marsh's cows, he told me many times, they think we're the parents. They think we're the mother and father because since their eyes were barely open, they were feeding them from a bottle, milk and so forth. But then, of course, when the bull, I forget his name there, Dharma, grew up to become a bull, then he got his own mind about matters, and he's very tough to deal with. But for the first two and a half to three years, that bull thought Tripreimars was his mother. <laughs> so, um, we have affection even for the animals, but it, we don't allow ourselves to fall in love with that animal. We should actually allow ourselves to fall in love with only one person, and that is Krishna. We may have affection for many, mother, father, brother, sister, wife, husband, all varieties, friends, but we should fall in love with Krishna exclusively. And that is the, the great art of living life in love of God. To be a devotee of Krishna and to live your life in love of God does not mean you become a nerd for the rest of society, you see, an unwanted, uh, uh, ineffective, non-desirable mm -hmm. entity. Actually, those who actually do awaken love of Krishna, who are the great devotees, fully absorbed in love of Krishna, they are sought after in society like anything, real human society, right? like anything. Bhakti Manota, of course, is a very classic example, because he was situated in the world, 
in terms of his position. He was not a renunciate. He didn't live in an ashram. He lived at home. He had a job. He was a court magistrate. He, basically, he even administered the death penalty to a, to a criminal, I think, on two occasions. But if we study the life of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he is fully absorbed in love of Krishna morning, noon, and night. And he was so desirable at a point in his life when he just wanted to be away from the worldly activities and uh, just live the most simple material existence with his family. Uh, he had some excuses why he was backing out from government. And so the government came forward and said, well, no, we'll build, a, we'll, we'll build a train track right to your front door just to bring you to work. And they did. They put the train track. Of course, it was, it was like if we lived up in the woods and the town council wanted us to come to every meeting so badly that they built the road right to our door, right? Well, the railroad was a great thing. So they built the railroad right to Bhaktivinoda Thakur's door. And if you go there, you step out his front door, you walk 10 feet, and there's a railroad track. Now, if they did that here, we would go out with placards and protest, take that train somewhere else, not out in front of my house. But it's relative. And that was a great, that was a modern thing, you know. Now, I, I'm like, Marvel, how do these people live on the road? You know, the houses right on the road and out 30 and all. But the fact is, when they first put those houses there, there wasn't any cars. And then when the cars came, they came so slow, there wasn't two a day. Now, the lights right through your house every time a car turns, the lights go through their living room. Even right at the end of our driveway down at the main road there. Every time a car turns in at night, the lights through the driveway. Oh, I would find that so irritating. You see? Even here, this close to the road, especially in summer when your windows are open, everything goes up and down the road. I hear it. I can't wait to get into the forest. You see? But there was a time when being right next to the road, and still for many people, like in India, they want to be smack in the city, neighbors left, right, center, living in the basement, over your head, all around, people. They think that's very nice. And we think, oh, let's get out of here. Give me some room, you know. So it's, it's relative. Hmm? Bhaktivinoda Thakur was so, everyone was so uh, impressed with Bhaktivinoda Thakur that even the government didn't want to let go of him. Not because he was a good man, and not because of all these things. Ultimately because of the real substance of the person. He was a great devotee of Krishna. So, I don't want to go on too long here. What's the time? Eight, eight what? Almost eight. Okay. But Mahaprabhu, when speaking with Ramananda Roy about the goal of life, put some questions before Ramananda Roy. And Ramananda Roy was, in Mahaprabhu's opinion, the most expert person to answer uh, his questions about the ultimate goals of life. So it's a simple question and answer, about uh, 10 questions or less. Uh, we'll see, about 10 questions, very simple. Mahaprabhu says, what is the essence of learning in the field of educational activities? Ramananda Roy replies, There is no superior quality of learning other than the knowledge pursued in regard to devo devotional service to Krishna. That is the uh, answer, the goal in that. You may learn so many things. Like I know so many things. We all know so many things. But in the end, if you don't know how to perform devotional activities to Krishna, you are considered ignorant. And you don't know anything. Ignorant fools, who doesn't know about devotion, who doesn't know how to perform devotion, ultimately is still ignorant. Because devotion, and he begins with devotion, hmm? devotional service, uh, is at the top of the goals in this human form of life. How to serve God. Hmm? What is God? How to serve Him. All these things, all this knowledge, this leads to perfection. Let us say, you went to school back in the 60s and you learned cobalt programming for computers. Well, you can't get a job with that today. That's a has-been education. It is ineffective. There are many things in this country 
where or in any country you learn them, society, times move on, the thing you learn has no ap application. There are many examples, but you know how to serve Krishna. And you know the various arts of serving Krishna. They have not become outdated yet. In fact, we're learning them from books that are thousands of years old. 500 years old, Chaitanya Charitamrita, 5,000 years old, Srimad Bhagavatam. They're not outdated. So mundane education is not real education, and it becomes outdated. Some children learn history, and after a while there's a social revolution. They burn all those history books and write some new ones. Who knows what happened in the past? Especially when you go into the Incas and the Mayas and all sorts of things. How do they know what happened? They were just there, that's all they know. And after that, it's all speculation. I mean, there was a period of time where people followed Darwin's theory, of, theory in, like a religion, in education. Now people were burning those books. But our parents, our, you know, the older devotees here, their parents, they grew up on the, on the bottle of Darwinianism. And now it's being trashed. And give it another 50 years and it'd be the butt of jokes. It's on the way out. And that means they just learned a lie for 150 years. You see. So in, 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 in Krishna consciousness, we learn how to serve Krishna. What is Krishna? What is God? All these things. That is real knowledge. It doesn't get disproved a decade or two, a century or two later, in the middle of our life, it all gets disproved. It hasn't happened yet, ever. We may refine a particular understanding. There may be differences of opinions over subtle spiritual points. But as it is said, we all agree that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the differences are very, very minor. But in the field of material learning, sometimes the difference is so great the textbooks and everything are just burned after that because it is useless. So then he says, <coughs> Mahabrabhu says, what is the highest fame? Ramananda Roy says, the highest fame of a living entity is the reputation of being a devotee of Krishna. You might be part of a great political party in this country. You might be, you know, from the Navy SEAL team. You might be, you know, the bodyguard of the president. You might be Billy Gates. But when you go up into the heavenly planets, people go, who's Billy Gates? What's a seal? Well, that's one of the lower species, <laughs> you see. But if you go all the way to Brahma Loka and, and present yourself, well, I'm a humble devotee of Krishna. Oh, a devotee of Krishna, very rare. And we welcome you to come here. They'll be very happy to receive you there. The highest reputation is being a devotee of Krishna. Of course, in the lower world, people may say, well, what is Krishna? Who is Krishna? Then your preaching opportunity begins. You see. <clears throat> <clears throat> the highest, uh, what is the most valuable possession of life among all the assets of the world? Ramananda Roy replies, one who has transcendental love for Radha and Krishna is to be considered the richest person in the world. We used to do collection in New York and other places on the street, and we would say, sir, could you help out? We're, we're, we're helping the poor. We're helping the poor. Could you chip in something today? They would give us 50 cents or a dollar. We'd say, thank you. Take this magazine and read all about it. So one moralist in our movement, who's a temple president at that time, he complained. You know, this is, a, this is a lie. Why are you telling them? And I made a reference to this point, and I said, the only rich person who has love of Krishna, they never even heard about Krishna. I don't care if they're multimillionaires. They're dirt poor in the estimation of the absolute truth. They have no love for Krishna. They don't know what is God. They're dirt poor, regardless of how much money. So the poor person we're helping it was the person we were talking to. To engage them in Krishna's service and take this, sir, and read all about it. Or back to God in magazine. So that was the word jugglery of the Sankirtan devotees. But it wasn't just a, a trick of words, it was true. Mahabrabhu says, Ramananda Roy says, who has no love of Krishna is a poor man. Who has love of Krishna is the richest person in the world. Uh, <clears throat> 
Question, what is the most grievous type of sorrow among all sorrows and distress of life? The, what, what's the worst type of sorrow and distress? Huh? There are so many distresses in this world, particularly when we lose a loved one or a relation with a loved one. Huh? Of course, some people suicide over money losses. The greatest loss is the loss of money. Some people suicide over name and fame. They lose their fame, their status quo. The pain, the sorrow even drives them in that direction, you see. Mm -hmm. um, Ramana Roy says, there is no greater sorrow, there is no greater pain than the unhappiness created by separation from devotees of Krishna. Now, some people might say, well, that's a flowery thing to say. Mm -hmm. And that's all that it is. But then we would argue and say, no, actually not. The history of the world has shown that people will resort and they will show us many symptoms of heartbreak and sorrow. But this separation, vipralamba, this has shown, and Mahaprabhu showed the greatest feelings of vipralamba. We have not seen two lovers in separation sweat blood from their forehead. It is mentioned in the scriptures that there are such feelings of separation between loved ones. Well, we have not seen it here. That in the feelings of sadness from separation, that they sweated blood. Mahaprabhu used to sweat blood out of the pores of his forehead. So intense was his feelings of separation. We have seen people fall down in a faint at the loss of a loved one, or the loss of money, or the prospect of their fame is now they have been publicly disgraced. But we have not seen them fall down and the joints in their bones become dislocated and stretched out by six inches. And their body increase in size by another 30% its normal size. We have not seen such feelings of separation. Such feelings are mentioned in scriptures and Mahaprabhu showed them. Those are Mahabhav. So... Not simply flowery words. Oh, that's a flowery statement. The greatest suffering is absence from devotees. You know, No, it is a real statement. And there are many devotees in the world who somehow or another, they get separated from the other devotees. Maybe it's their bad karma for the time, or Krishna's teaching them a lesson, or maybe they just made a wrong choice on their own. But they get way out there, way away from devotees, and everything else comes to them money, a home, have, you know, all the external things come to them, and in the end, they're crying for the association of devotees. It may not just happen immediately, but many, many examples are there. Many, many examples are there. So it is not just a flowery statement. <clears throat> it is backed up by practical experience. Who is the most perfectly liberated among all liberated souls in the universe? Answer. One who has transcendental love for Sri Krishna is the greatest of all liberated souls. Question, what is the best song that a person can sing? Answer, the essence, the essence of all songs is the singing of the transcendental glories of Radha and Krishna. Top of the pops. What is the highest benefit of life that a person can seek? Answer, there is no greater gain in life than the association of devotees engaged in the service of Krishna. Question. Who is to be remembered constantly by all living beings? Answer. One should always think of the transcendental name, fame, and qualities of Sri Krishna. Question. What should, be the living, uh, what should the living being meditate on? Answer. The mo most perfect type of meditation is to meditate upon the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Question. Where should the living being reside exclusively living all other residential quarters? Answer. One should live in Vrindavan, where the transcendental pastimes and Rasalila are perpetually performed. But we find that many of Krishna's great devotees did not live in Vrindavan. Some lived in Puri. Some lived in in, in, uh, in Navadvip. And others had neither the opportunity to live in either place, or even if they had the opportunity to live in those places, they sometimes gave that up, and they went to other places to live mm -hmm. and to create a spiritual atmosphere. So it's obvious. In this world, we can't all move to Vrindavan. In fact, that's half the problem with Vrindavan now, 
it's swelled at least four times the, pop, uh, the capacity and population that it's actually built to sustain, especially the, uh, what's it called, the infrastructure, water, all the things necessary, plumbing, all the things. It just creates an, uh, an environmental nightmare. It's this, the city is not built. It was a medieval city, and it's, it's filled with modern population and, and everything that goes along with it. But the meaning is that we should live in a transcendental environment where the Supreme Lord and his devotees are present. We should not go and live in an environment independent of the Supreme Lord. And uh, wherever the deity is worshipped, wherever the devotees chant the holy name, Krishna is present there. And that place is considered to be a holy place. Uh, in fact, Krishna says, I'm not in Vrindavan. I'm not in the hearts of the yogis. And he mentions one or two other places where he's not. But he says, but I am always present where my pure devotees chant my holy names. So that is the... Uh, the explanation behind this. The best of places to live, Vrindavan. Hmm? The company of devotees, where devotional service is performed, where the deity is present. Manu Samhita says, you should not go to a place and live where there is no temple, where there is no river, where there is no Vaishnava. Yet Srila Prabhupada came here, of course, this town, uh, this uh, place, excuse me, this country has many rivers, but it doesn't have many temples, and it didn't have any devotees when he came. So that's the mark of a very, very, very great devotee, a Mahabhagavad. Then he may go to any place, a nowhere place, where there are no devotees, no temples, or anything divine, and establish those things. That is a very rare thing. It's just like when you're cold, make a fire. So the great devotees, when they find that there are, there are no devotees around them, then they just start making them. <laughs> they convert them. And then they're very happy in the presence of the devotees. Um, what should the living entity hear about, leaving aside all of their topics? Answer. The reciprocal loving pastimes of Radha and Krishna are the only subject matter for oral reception by the living entity. Question. What is the most worshipable object among all those to be worshipped? Answer. The topmost worshipable object is the combined names of Radha and Krishna. Even higher than deity worship is your japa. But to become proficient in chanting the holy names in the path of sadhana, worshiping of the deity, is, is, is required. It is, a, it, is a, it is a process we should learn. It is a process that we must engage in. But the highest worship of the Supreme Lord is the worship of his holy names. And the other, those who want material enjoyment, they attain celestial bodies. Enjoyment is found in heaven. So they have to, that doesn't mean, though, the enjoyer that goes out and parties and just gets drunk and just runs all over town and just enjoys like an animal. And they want to enjoy, so they go to heaven? No, no, they get the body of an animal so they can run around naked and just eat anything and be unregulated and do whatever they like with no responsibility. When it says to cultivate enjoyment, that means that people who do karmakanda, who do many religious activities, pious activities, social welfare, and all these things, and helping the poor, and helping the animals, and all this help, 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 help people, uh, then they, they qualify to go to the heavenly planets. Mm -hmm. And there they enjoy. Cultivation of enjoyment means of a better life under scriptural rule and regulations. They may go to heaven, but those who just, just break out and do whatever they want in life, that's called the, the vikarmis. The karmis go to heaven. The devotees go to Vaikuntha or Goloka. And the party am animals, they go to hell. And hell is not particularly a place. Hell is anywhere. Hell is, hell is here today if you don't have any heat. <laughs> if you don't have a good house with insulation, that, that's hell. Hell's not hot. Hell's not cold. Hell is an expressive word. 
It means all kinds of miserable conditions. Some people are surrounded by wealth, name, fame, and things that, that you know, we sometimes would just like to have a little of, especially the wealth. But they are in hell. They are in hell. They suffer, 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 and then suicide or something. So much suffering. Hell doesn't mean necessarily poverty. Hell may be rich. Hell may be poor. Mahaprabhu has said, but actually hell is where there are no devotees. No devotees of Krishna. That is the hell. The hell of the hells. The great devotees pray, I will go to hell to serve Krishna. I will go to heaven to serve Krishna. The main point is, I must have service to Krishna. When uh, we went to Hawaii in 1985 and opened a preaching center in Waikiki and Ala Moana Harbor, on the 33rd floor of the Yacht Harbor Towers, overlooking the, the Pacific Ocean with nine shades of blue, we got a lot of criticism for that. Someone said we should have opened something out, on, out in Anaheim, or someone said we should open something in Harlem or something, you know. But rather we picked one of the most uh, heavenly planets, places on the planet. And the Vishnu Maharaj used to quote that verse. Give me heaven or give me hell, the main thing is service to Krishna. And then he used to say, we've been in hell long enough, so we're going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, then at a t after a time, we all moved there to Brahmaraj and all the devotees, we moved to Hawaii. And that became hell. <laughs> that became the hell. It rained nonstop for one and a half years, every single day. <laughs> that which was once heaven became hell. So, <clears throat> so that was the last. Um, that was the last question and the last answer. The above questions and answers contain the essence of all transcendental knowledge confirmed by the authoritative scriptures. Go All right, that's all I wanted to say this morning. Are there any questions, comments? You're welcome. Also. <coughs> <clears throat> All right. I have one thought. Yes. It refers to your earlier part of your discussion. It's a philosophy that comes under many guises and names, which is the, uh, it's a semi truth. It says that we're all living entities. We're actually, however minor, all expansions of Godhead. And this is the way by which he enters. The world to you know exhibit his pastimes and to he enjoys himself through us all the living entities as expansion. So what's wrong with enjoying this plane? This is all it's not pastime of the supreme lord. Well, we should go back to the creator and say you know you got to redesign this place. It's it, it, it's a catastrophe design. I mean, there's disease everywhere. We're all suffering from arthritis and old age and like could you restructure this thing and maybe we could enjoy for you. Enjoyment, and if this world, we have come here to enjoy for God, if you analyze, from the minute you wake up, it's like, ah, the back, oh, the elbow, oh, my neck, you know, it's like there's just so, it's just a struggle for existence, you know? Why don't you just jump in and hit the cold shower in January? It's just like, ooh, you know, you, you, you have to work, you have to do so many things. I mean, the Christians used to say, God put us here to enjoy. Then we say, well, he's a really a crappy God <laughs> because he doesn't know how to make a good place to enjoy. The place, I mean, the numbers of diseases that there are in the world, and my God, if smallpox comes to this country, as is the major fear in bio, you know, that's bio, biological warfare. If they manage to pull that off, we will see a horror in our life that makes the World Trade Centers look like a Sunday picnic. And that scourge of smallpox has hit the world before in Europe, in medieval times. It's been around. I have all us older folks, we got a mark on our arm. It's a big circle. You kids don't have that. Because just shy of, you know, this last century, smallpox was a threat in this country. And everybody got inoculated. They finally drove it out. They finally extincted it. People used to die from it in your, in our, in your grandparents' age and all. No, it's gone. It's gone to the point you're not vaccinated. We are. And these evildoers want to bring that back as a weapon of mass destruction. If they're successful in that, 
you know, we will see some harm. You know, and of course, the government's working. They have uh, they announced they have so many millions of vaccination <clears throat> serum, and they're making it like anything right now. They weren't focused. Now they're focused. You see. There's so many diseases in this world, so much. I mean, what type of God is it? He enjoys seeing all these things. You know, murder and mass destruction. Is that how he, if, if he enjoys that, then let's get the guns and go out and blare away, you see. So that's very faulty. It's one thing to say it. And the hippies used to say, is this organized religion? And we used to say, you know, well, yeah, we have a temple. No, man, I'm not, I'm not into organized religion. You know, organization's not good, right? Well, why don't you pass your urine out your ear then? Organization's not good. Why don't you stuff your food up your nose? Your whole body is organized. As soon as it gets unorganized, it's a disaster. Disease sets in, and you're dead. We thrive on it. Why don't you drive on the left side of the road? You know, like organization. It was just a hippie philosophy that when philosophers like, okay, let's see how you go. You know, let's how this holds up under the, under the uh, you know, let's stretch it to see it, how much it fits. And it didn't fit. It doesn't work. We thrive out of organization. You see, well, you put money in your bank. Why don't we just put it in somebody else's account? <laughs> You'll sue them for that misorganization. We thrive on it. So that was the point. Once I was at a university and, 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 and the issue came up about abortion. So there's a group of kids standing around me. We're all about the same age then, early 20s. And, and I was, I was uh, you know, saying, you know, that was very controversial. Still it is, but it's, it's old news in the ear, so we just forget it. But it was very, very controversial at the time. So, of course, I'm, I'm arguing to the point of, no, abortion is... is, is shouldn't be allowed. It's sinful. It's, 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 it's cruel. It's an act of violence. It's even murder. And then uh, this guy was standing there. He goes, so you, you believe the souls in all living things, right? And I said, yes. He goes, well, you murder so many oranges. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, sure. You just spit the seeds in the garbage, right? Oh, I had said they throw the babies in the garbage. <clears throat> <clears throat> then he picked up on that and he said, well, you spit the seeds in the garbage. And I said, uh, yeah, but I think there's a difference between a seed and a baby. <laughs> and he goes, well, I don't. And I, goes, I said, so there's no difference between a human baby, human fetus, and an orange seed. And he goes, no. So then I said, so your philosophy is that there's no need to discriminate. Life is just life across the board. He goes, yep. If you can spit an art seed in the garbage, you can throw a baby, a fetus in the garbage. I said, so then I just started pushing the point. I said, so your logic, your philosophy is there's no need to discriminate. If it's life, it's life. If it's matter, it's matter, right? He goes, right. I said, if it's matter, it's matter, right? Right. I said, I said so go in the cafeteria. I pointed to the canteen on campus. I said, go in there and bring out a sandwich of your choice, which is basically dead matter. And then I said, and then go over there and pick up that dog stool and come over here and eat them both right in front of us and show us that matters matter and soul's life is life. Show us applicably that you don't have to discriminate between levels of matter or levels of life. You know? And there was like 30 kids just watching this whole like, you know, nasty debate. And then this went, ha! Everybody just laughed like anything. This guy turned like, like, <laughs> totally red. It wasn't applicable. Right? And uh, many years later in Washington, D.C., right out in front of the Capitol on the, you know, where we used to sell t-shirts, there was a Rathiatra there. <clears throat> and the devotees came running over to me and they said, Mars, Mars, there's a Christian lady out here. She's really outrageous and she's disturbing everything. So whatever. So I went out and there was a group. They had their placards, you know, you know, against the devil and all these things, and it was all about us. But they were a little distant. This lady had come in. It was summertime, and she was wearing a, a, a red mini skirt. She was very intelligent, and she was very fired up. She had her Bible, and she was doing her thing. And a bunch of bhaktas and bhaktines were around her, and she was like very practiced at what she was doing. And she kind of captured the scene. So then I got there, and um, and she was making this point that you people are deceptive. You are deceptive. And the point what she was making is, <clears throat> and then, then they said, well, how are we deceptive? She goes, you sometimes wear wigs. 
you are deceptive, right? So her point was because the devotees had shaved heads, they would sometimes wear a wig. Well, in this country, we didn't make the wigs. Everybody wears wigs. Lawyers, doctors, so many people wear wigs because they're ashamed to have a bald head. So devotees used to go out and sell books in the airport, walking around with a big shaved head, used to like, you know, you'd just be walking up to somebody with a book and this shaved head would push them away like a magnet or something. So they used to wear wigs. They're called wig hats. So she said, that's deceptive, that's deceptive. So I picked up on this point, that's deceptive. And I said, I don't think it's really deceptive, otherwise the Supreme Court judge is also deceptive. And many women are also deceptive because the wigs are for sale. There's shops in every big city. New York, you just go in, that's all they sell is wigs. So are all these people, heads of state, lawyer, are they all deceptive? No, 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 but you're deceptive because, because, you know, the way you are is actually you, you know. So she made her point like that. You follow? That we're deceptive. So then I just said, you're also very deceptive. How am I deceptive? And I said, well, you have those beautifully shaped legs, very smooth. I think that's quite deceptive. Why don't you just show us those big hairy legs that you have? <laughs> like the woolly mammoth. <laughs> because the fact is, ladies' legs and men's legs are basically the same. There's hair on legs, you know. And she just, everybody laughed, and she just started squeaking like a mouse and broke into tears and ran away. <laughs> So, <laughs> be careful using those, you know, <laughs> lower punches, you know, they can backfire on you too, you gotta, but that's a fact. It's like, I was saying, you say we're deceiving, you were deceiving, I said, I, it was a little elaborate, I said, you're deceiving all the young men here, you're deceiving all the men here, everybody thinks you have these nice, clean, smooth legs, but the fact is, you have hairy legs, and you're deceiving us. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't care, I mean, whether a person shaves their legs or they don't. That's irrelevant. But in philosophy, what you say has to fit when we start pulling on it. It should fit all around the rim and not just be one-sided. Then it doesn't, it, it is not very useful for us. It doesn't hold up. So, you know, you wouldn't attack an older person like that with that kind of logic. They would feel insulted. But young people are a little more, you know expandable in those <laughs> issues. <laughs> and Prabhupada's remark when the lady asked, why do you shave your head? And he said, better a cool head than cool legs. She was wearing the miniskirt also. Yeah. Better a cool head than cool legs. <laughs> so so that, that, that's, not, that's not a right philosophy. No. God put us here as his expansions to enjoy. We, when you analyze enjoyment, he's enjoying, and there is no enjoyment in the material world. There's only separatism. The separatism is there. If we connect to him, then we can enjoy. He enjoys through us, actually. In his lila, all the devotees, in one sense, Krishna is enjoying through all his devotees. He's enjoying his devotees, and they're immediately taken out of this place. It's not possible to enjoy the sweet taste of straw. For a human, this is great straw. Of course, Jayananda once ate a coconut tree to see if it might be edible. <laughs> but he decided it wasn't. <laughs> so certain things just have no taste in them. You can't relish it. You, know. you can chew grass in the summer. You know, some of the grass has a nice little taste in it. You know. But you've got to be a cow to, or a horse to enjoy chewing dry grass. Okay, someone will say, no, 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 there's actually a taste in there. Yes, in all this material enjoyment, there is actually a little bit of <coughs> enjoyment there. It is very, very small. It's called chapalasuka, and it vanishes just like that. While you're enjoying it, it vanishes. Yesterday, someone sent us some sweets. It was prashadam, but they were sweets. And some of them were really rich. So after the second one, I, I couldn't have eaten a third one. They were so rich. <coughs> it's not that you could just keep eating sweets and just at a point it's like that's enough you see and in this world enjoyment even where it can be found it's very limited short-lived limited and many times accompanied by a hurricane of suffering immediately afterwards like a wave of suffering accompanies material enjoyment 
<clears throat> Why is that? Because we live in the land of the laws of physics, karma. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You borrow from the bank, you have to pay back with interest. Reactionary activities are here. In the spiritual world, there are, there are no reactionary activities. Nothing bears the reaction other than more. More the same, more enjoyment, more pleasure, more satisfaction, more love, increasing. How beautiful is the Supreme Lord? He is infinitely beautiful. How, beauty, how beautiful is Radharani? She is infinitely beautiful. And there is a, <clears throat> to give you an idea how that works, I think it's Krishna Kali Raja Goswami, but maybe another. <coughs> he says that both Radha and Krishna are supr supremely beautiful. And seeing, and I forget which one he starts with, but um, seeing the beauty of Radharani, this enhances Krishna's beauty. <coughs> you see? <coughs> then Radharani, seeing the beauty of Krishna, it is enhanced. This enhances her beauty. Again, seeing the enhanced beauty of Radharani, Krishna's beauty is enhanced. You see, it's like a couple together. Singular, they have their beauty, but together they complement each other. Why, why, why don't we just wear, you know, in, when you dress in secular clothes, just... You know, red sweater, red socks, red dress, red shoes, you know, red bows, red hats, red cars. It's like, ah! You want some variety because it complements. And it's noted that the boys, they don't know how to dress. They wear always the wrong colors. So they end up wearing grays most of the time, grays and browns, because when they get into colors, until they get over 50, you see all these guys walking around with red pants when they're 50 in Florida, stuff like that, yellow, green. Compliment. Couples compliment. The supreme couple compliments each other. So their beauty is always increasing. No one can answer how beauty they, beautiful they are without bringing in the, the conception of infinitely so, infinitely beautiful. And all their characteristics are like that. Infinitely kind, infinitely gracious, infinitely charming, infinitely beautiful, infinitely sweet, infinitely affectionate, infinitely giving. All these things infinitely. And here... It's all finite, 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 finite. It's just limited. Limited, 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 limited. This really, when they call these companies such and such limited, <coughs> they're absolutely true. They should call this a material world limited. It's all limited. And our life is the most limited. It's so short. Even the human form of life. Trees live longer than humans. Many of them. Most of them, actually. Most of these trees... Uh, well, not in this forest. We're going to trim it. But most trees outlive us humans. You see, 100 years, 200 years for a tree is quite ordinary, you know, provided someone doesn't cut it down. But the natural life is there. Very limited place. We cannot call this... The, the, you understand the point? You cannot call this the place of enjoying where God is happy to see you enjoy. Because you just analyze, you're not enjoying that much. You get at a point you can like enjoy a little bit. Like what's Friday night? You know, in the material concept, it's it's only part of one day. All day Friday you worked, and then part of Friday evening they kind of like do something to enjoy. Well, we don't have to work in the spiritual world. There is no what we call hard labor, full of activity. Maybe even building houses is there. Many activities. Milking cows is there. Many That's hard work in this world. Wow. Nanda Kishore is going to get an electric milking machine with 50 cows. There's no way he can manage 50 cows milking twice a day. You see? Oh, even milking a cow is hard work here. But there, nothing is hard work. There's no energy limitation. There is no work. There is only, it is said, every word is a song. Every step, every movement is a dance. All work becomes a dance. It is an opposite world. So the enjoyment theory won't hold up. Won't hold up. We used to, people used to ask us, and you're young, it doesn't settle in. And then at a point, I don't know, I guess different people, different times, for me, I was quite older. I realized the, the question was, do you think there would ever be a world war? 
You think there'll ever be a World War III? Because I was born just after World War II. You've heard about it. You've seen films. So when I was growing up, it was like, you know, it was just there just before we were born. So every kids used to... And then I realized much later on, the world's always at war. There hasn't been a day of peace since it began. And if you get into the history books, you'll find out, I mean, deep into the college level of history, there's war. Oh, it's just after the World War I, there was, there was some other fighting, then it was World War II, after that was the Korean War, after that was the Vietnam War, after that was the Nicaraguan War, and now it just, it just, it just goes on and on and on. Now it's a war against terrorism. That takes the headlines. But there's so many wars. There's a war going on in the Philippines. War, 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 war. And in some of these wars, millions of people. In Russia in the World War II, two million people were killed. And that, that's a lot of people. So, from so many angles of vision, this material world is not created as a place for enjoyment. <clears throat> It is enjoying only in those, in the eyes of those who don't have a clear understanding of reality. Those who have the clear reality understanding, they may transcend this world and enter reality, the real reality. Sometimes even devotees have twisted this around. Well, you know, come on, the reality is. No, the reality is that devotional service, your job in worshiping the deity and offering food to Krishna, this is all that exists. Everything else is a fleeting illusion. Everything. Even devotees lost that after a while, and they would start to say, well, you know, the reality is of family, or the reality is of work. The rea Those aren't realities. <clears throat> Those are not realities. They're not even realities in this world. Where is yesterday's work? It doesn't exist. There's only some paper in exchange for it. You don't stop working. You have to do that. <laughs> the working devotees have to work. Mahabrabhu assigned different service to different devotees. And one of them was the working devotees. He, I forget the devotees, but he told some to worship the deity, some to chant the holy name, some to study the scripture, and some to work and support the other devotees. So in a household, one person works, four or five people get to do devotion, learn, be children, grow up. The household gets to help the temple, and it's that's, if it's looked at in, in relation to that, then sometimes it takes that pounding edge off the, the work, you know. At the same time, in the temple, what, the, what happens? Devotees forget that service is service. They, they get into this thing that even washing the pots is something like work. They try, uh, who's going to do this? It's just like, but when you offer them a sweet ball, they don't, they, don't, they don't argue out, you know, well, you should take it. I took it last time. Prashadam they take first. But other things sometimes in devotees in big temple, then they, they try to get out of that because they just forget. It's not work. It's service to Krishna. It is not work. If you want to call it work, then call it the labor of love. It is not like work. And work for a Vaishnava should also be seen like that. It's a source of, <clears throat> of support for service. And whatever wealth we get, we should utilize that for Krishna. Given a healthy, pros prosperous life, that is given to the devotees. Don't have to put yourself in poverty. And all, you should have a prosperous life of sufficient food, clothing, shelter, and all the things that surround that. That is, that is laudable and that is accepted to work for that. But one should not just go on trying to increase that, increase that, increase that. We're richer. Throw away all our old sweaters. We can buy more expensive ones now. We can upgrade and just throw away our, you know, you know, used cars and just buy all new ones and just upgrade materially. That is, that is a misuse of material wealth. So, it's time over. You're not going to work today? <laughs> I'm also working. I, I, I shoveled, myself and Bridget Kishore shoveled this whole driveway. I felt very bad about everybody sliding in and out of here yesterday, so we shoveled that. But I was still massaging sore muscles up until 10 minutes before class. So. You didn't have any sore muscles, though, did you? That's the difference between you and me. <laughs> the young and the old. Hare Krishna.